joining us today for the Fuchs Lecture. This lectureship in law was inaugurated in 1993 to honor the memory of Professor Ralph Fuchs, a distinguished and respected member of our faculty from 1945 until his death in 1985. Professor Fuchs was an accomplished teacher and scholar and a pioneer in the area of administrative law, but he was equally well known for his commitment to public service and for the dedication, creativity, compassion, and imagination that he brought to that work. He was active during the McCarthy era and saw the need for organizations that would work against the repressive mood of that time and would champion civil liberties. He became the first chairman of the executive board of the Indiana Civil Liberties Union. He was active in the NAACP and was appointed to its state committee on legal redress. And he was deeply committed to defending the rights of free speech and free press and free assembly in the university context, uh, eventually becoming president of the American Association of University Professors. This lecture series honors his commitment to combining excellence in teaching and scholarship with extraordinary dedication to public service. Past Fuchs lecturers include Sir David Williams of Cambridge University, William Gould, former chairman of the National Labor Relations Board, and Morris Dees, civil rights lawyer and co-founder of the Southern Poverty Law Center. Today, it is an honor to introduce Elliot Milstein, Professor of Law at the Washington College of Law at American University as the 2012 Fuchs Lecturer. Professor Milstein holds a BA from the University of Hartford, a JD from the University of Connecticut, and an LLM from Yale. He joined the faculty at American University in 1972 and has made his career there. He served as Dean of the College of Law from 1988 to 1995, and as interim president of American University from 1993 to 94. Professor Milstein is one of the most prominent and influential clinical law scholars in the nation. That influence started at home. He founded the clinical program at American and has taught clinical courses in a range of areas, general practice, international human rights, criminal litigation, pretrial litigation, and public interest law, among others. His influence has now spread more widely, as Professor Milstein has dedicated himself to teaching other clinical teachers. He's a frequent presenter on the goals of clinical education and its role in teaching professional values, and is in high demand as a consultant in that area. Recently, for instance, he served as director of a rule of law project to train clinical teachers in China. He has authored leading publications on clinical education and is currently at work on a co-authored book entitled Theory and Practice in Clinical Pedagogy. He has also been deeply involved in the Association of American Law Schools, including through its Committee on Clinical Education. In 2000, he served as president of that association, the first clinical teacher ever to serve in that capacity. His presidential initiative that year, fittingly, was an equal justice project that was founded by the Open Society Institute, funded, excuse me, by the Open Society Institute. His lecture today is entitled, Uncertainty, Indeterminacy, and the Law School Curriculum. After the lecture, there will be a reception on the uh, third floor of the law school in the faculty lounge, to which you are all invited. Um, please join me now in welcoming this year's Fuchs Lecture. Thank you, Hannah, for that delicious introduction. I, it was for me more delicious than the pizza is for you, I suppose. Uh, I, um, uh, thinking of this, uh, I always like to start a talk with a joke, and this is the story of Moses arriving with the Jewish people at the Red Sea, and he can't figure out how to get across, so he calls in a general and says, what should we do? And the general said, well, normally we would get, um, we would build pontoon bridges and people could march across, but the Egyptians are coming and there's no time. So he calls in Admiral, what should we do? And the Admiral says, well, normally we'd get barges and we'd float people across, but we have no barges, it's not enough time. So he calls in his public relations guy and says, well, what, what should we do? He says, oh, I don't know, but if, if you can solve the problem, we're gonna get you 20 pages in the Bible for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I like to imagine, I mean, it's a kind of a standard joke, but I like to imagine what happened next 
he called in his lawyer to negotiate with God and the Red Sea parted. But uh, we don't know that part of the story. It didn't make it into the Bible because lawyers' roles are often silent and in, in the background. Uh, I, 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 uh, but, but the idea of problem solving in, in new and unusual situations is the work of lawyers. Uh, I can't claim to have parted the Red Sea or I'm not quite as old as Moses, but I do sometimes introduce myself as the world's oldest clinical teacher and I did that in China. Hanna said I'd, I've taught clinical teachers in China. My first trip there I said I'm the world's oldest clinical teacher and it got translated as the world's greatest clinical teacher. And, <laughs> and I, I, uh, so I'm not quite the oldest and I'm certainly not the greatest, but I am, but I am here. So. Um, so I've been a clinical teacher for 41 years, and I, and I have, um, you know, it's amazing to look back and think about what legal education was when I started or when I was a law student, and think about all of the improvements in legal education over these decades, and, and I, sometimes I'm really happy about it, and sometimes I'm depressed by all the things that have remained the same. And today, as you know, is Columbus Day, which celebrates the creation by Christopher Columbus Langdell of the Socratic Casebook Method, <laughs> the national holiday. Um, um, and in, in, in the Casebook Method, students are taught the, sort of the corpus juris and the skills of legal analysis, a skill that I think is often called thinking like a lawyer, and I think of it as thinking partially like a lawyer. Um, so even, you know, the case method is not the same as it was during Langdell's era. Professors have, have uh, changed it and um, includes now legal realism and includes critical theory. Uh, and the law school curriculum embraces a lot more than the scientific analysis of, of appellate cases. But uh, we do also know that even as faculty want to and do embrace a broader vision of what can be taught through cases. Students resist this. Students clamor for, want to, hunger for black letter law and mastery of, of doctrine. And so the, the, sometimes the lesson that the law is indeterminate uh, is lost. Um, and faculty, we get evaluated by students. Sometimes we succumb to the pressure and try to bring clarity to the law uh, at uh, in, in our classes, even though in practice it's not quite like that. Um, Martha Minow, and who's the dean of Harvard Law School, and I suppose the, uh, the heir to Langdell, along with Todd Ra Rakoff, the, the academic dean there, wrote an article recently where they're promoting the idea of a problem-based method uh, of um, of teaching and the creation of, and I think it since has happened, the creation of what they called rich problem sets to teach law students problem solving. Um, but they also note that the, that the case method has been astonishingly stable o over the years. And, and um, the case method does many, many good things, but in my view, and I think in theirs, um, it's good for some things and not for others. It, and it leaves out a great deal of what students need to know in order to become lawyers capable of solving the kinds of problems that we are called on to solve in society. And at worst, the case method misleads students as to what is entailed in being a lawyer. In law school classrooms, uh, clients are a distant abstraction, rarely mentioned. Facts are given. Decisions of appellate courts are privileged as sites for discovery of law um, and for making law. And um, the construction of narratives, narratives, so much the work of lawyers is given quite short shrift or ignored. I like to think the classroom door closes, the real world, real world is shut out. The complexity of it is marshaled. The problems are predefined. And many of the variables that affect how lawyers uh, make decisions and take actions are held constant. And there's sound pedagogical reasons for doing that. You're trying to isolate lots of variables in order to teach other things. Um, uh, but what is really m most stressful, challenging, and I think continuously interesting about being a lawyer, 
stems from the fact, uh, in the words of, of uh, Professor Gary Blasey, lawyering entails solving or sometimes making worse, problems of clients and others under conditions of extraordinary complexity and uncertainty in a virtually infinite range of settings. And so opening this door to let clients in, um, their problems in, and let students and their solutions out has seemed to some of us to be the key innovation that permits the law school and law professors to prepare them to practice in this indeterminate universe that they will face. Uh, I'm using the words indeterminacy and uncertainty almost interchangeably. Um, probably shouldn't, but um, uncertainty, probably the reaction that we have when we're faced with indeterminacy, but it's, it's uh, sometimes easier to, to use them interchangeably, and I like indeterminacy. Um, Indeterminacy is, I think, means that something is uh, incapable of being definitely defined, where rules themselves don't provide you with an answer to a question. It won't surprise you to know, you heard my, the introduction, that I take a clinocentric view of legal education. That's a word that I made up that usually gets a laugh, but I guess it's maybe. <laughs> Maybe, maybe you'll like me better if I tell you that we're building a new law school building at American University and the exterior is going to be Indiana limestone. Uh, but uh, clinical education in its modern form started in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, uh, it was spurred by grants from the Ford Foundation and grants from the federal government. There was a categorical grant program to support it. And those of us who were recruited to be clinical teachers normally came from legal services programs or public defenders, and we were still confident that if we could improve the justice system, uh, lawyers could be warriors in, the, in, in, in uh, uh, harnessing that system to improve social justice. Uh, we were also, having been lawyers, dis worried about or disappointed by the disconnects between what our legal education had taught us and what we felt like we needed to know in order to, to, uh, to be lawyers. And we were largely lawyers for poor people in trial courts, um, and that was the frame of reference that we brought to early clinical education. We, we, we shared a generational sense, though, that education needed to be relevant. and our actions needed to be related to social justice. That was, the, that, that was one of the prevailing moods of, the, of, of our generation. And so uh, the defining characteristic of clinical education was that it would first of all be centered in the, and having law students actually represent people in court or in, their, in helping to solve their problems if not in court, in the real world, and that they would be educated by faculty members while they were doing it. Um, but there was no pedagogy. There was no knowledge about what it is that people who were engaged in the practice of law should be taught. So we, 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 um, so the development of new teaching methods and the development of new models and theories about lawyering became the earliest intellectual project and central mission of clinical teachers. Uh, found, the people I lovingly called the founding generation of clinical teachers. Uh, and, and, you know, many of us shared a vision that we could contribute to a more just society by reforming legal education. Uh, our intention was to shape the abilities and more importantly the values of our students in order to produce competent lawyers at least some of whom would be committed to spend time working on behalf of the, of the disadvantaged or the poor. Um, because we felt that their decisions, their actions, their expectations would shape the future of the legal profession. And by shaping the future of the legal profession, shape the quality of justice in, in America. And um, our belief that calling that struggling for fairness, equality, freedom is the highest calling of a lawyer. Um, we felt like preparing our students to do that would extend our own reach. Um, th at the same time, we've come to understand that most of our students 
aren't going to be legal, legal providers for poor people. Most of our students will be engaged in other forms of legal practice and that we need to provide for them as well a high quality legal education, but one that's in, still imbued with values of justice and fairness because we think that's the mission of all lawyers regardless of whom they represent. We work a lot on making the things that we teach transferable across the many things that lawyers do. Um, now, the project of determining how to teach lawyering has required an inquiry into the, into the nature of the lawyering process, um, including analyzing the day-to-day -day work of lawyers. And uh, that ongoing work has been much more complex than most of us had originally imagined. Um, Fantastic. You have ducks in Indiana? So Amy, you know the story about the duck that went into the drugstore and said, let me have some chapstick and put it on my bill? Uh, keep you awake. Keep you awake. Uh, so uh, the, reason, the reason that I think that the work of, of figuring out lawyering has been so complex is because of what I've come to call the six indeterminacies. Um, the law is indeterminate. Facts are indeterminate. The lawyer-client relationship itself is indeterminate. Problem solving is indeterminate. Skills are indeterminate. And in order to deal with those characteristics of being a lawyer, we've had to create teaching methods that themselves are indeterminate. Um, so that's the sixth indeterminacy. Um, so our, our teaching has to enable students to make decisions and take actions through the thicket of uncertainty that defines the work of lawyers. Um, and their search, our students search for the givens, their attempts to find unquestionably binding legal precedent, their beliefs that they're experts out there, and particularly their clinical teachers, who know the answers to all their questions, all, right, there, all that turns out to be fruitless and frustrating. And so instead, we try to help them recognize decision moments that they hadn't seen, propose, help them propose courses of action at each of those decision moments. Uh, even though information's imperfect, um, decision making under conditions of uncertainty, and the complexity of the variables is sometimes difficult to grasp or to harness. Lawyers are called upon to make strategic decisions informed by knowing about client goals, legal rules, legal institutions, context within which problems arise, and more, uh, and, and more things than that. And, and uh, they're called on, making, on to make predictions about how people and institutions will behave in response to a stimulus that they can either provide or withhold. Um, and we sometimes say that a lawyer has good judgment, by which I think we mean uh, that he or she is best able to see the multiple paths there are for action and to connect uh, their predictions about what would happen on each of those paths to the achievement of goals uh, and to weigh and value the, those paths in, 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 in to enable them to make decisions. And you have to weigh both legal and non-legal factors in as well as interpersonal factors in making decisions. And of course, excellent lawyers also need the courage and the ability to carry out the things that they think will best uh, accomplish the goals. So let me go through these indeterminacies. Um, first, the indeterminacy of law is not an unfamiliar concept to any, to, to any of us. Uh, the, the idea that legal rules are malleable, um, that decisions are often the outcome of uh, the judge's values as much as the facts or adherence to precedent. It's not new and it's a legacy, I suppose, of the legal realist movement back to the 1920s, but um, um, much of what's written about indeterminacy by law professors is it looks at the uh, appellate courts and appellate court decisions. So with apologies to Judge Hamilton, uh, we, we clinicians look elsewhere. Um, the 
face of indeterminacy to the practicing lawyer is at a much lower, much lower level. Um, a lawyer doesn't have to spend too much time in a trial court to understand that um, what the trial judge there says and does is the law. And most of the things that a trial court judge says or does is the law because they're, for a multitude of reasons, not reviewable in any practical way by, by anyone else. Um, and the, the, those decisions are um, affected by the, the judge's values, prejudices, biases. And so um, the, this, the question of who the judge is can be as important as what legal doctrine says in terms of predicting outcome. Um, we had, uh, when I practiced in New Haven, we had what we called the Mancini exception to the hearsay rule, which was some completely made up exception to the hearsay rule that Judge Mancini believed in. And Judge Hamilton may even remember Judge Mancini because I know he, he, he practiced in, in New Haven. So uh, <laughs> it's a, uh, um, so, you know, you can either pull your hair out and say that's a terrible thing and that, the, and that legal doctrine as we know it ought to be sacrosanct or you can embrace the reality of what it is and gather the information that you need in order to affect the way a judge makes a decision in a way that would be favorable to your client. So uh, legal doctrine is malleable in ways that present opportunities as well as obstacles to the achievement of client goals. And um, even though you're often in situations where gathering information about the decision make, make, maker is difficult, um, you can make some predictions based upon what people tell you about how the person's behaved in the past or by going to the court and watching the person in action or by trying to guess how people in this particular role might behave. But you know, it isn't the Supreme Court. You can't go read all of Justice Kennedy's opinions to decide how to, how to titrate your brief uh, to get his vote on that critical, in that critical five to four decision. So we have to worry about the decisions of low level decision makers as, as um, the, the ones most important in the lives of our clients. So um, lawyers are called on to, to make to create strategy, to help clients make decisions, to help clients weigh risks um, by finding the sites for law. Um, what, what sites for law will, will operate in this situation and how will the, your understanding of that site for law affect the decision making? And so who has the power to make a decision that advances your cause? Um, what rules did that person operate under? How does that person understand the way those rules either constrain discretion or create discretion? What, how can you persuade that person that they have the discretion you want them to have in order to decide the case as you want them to decide it? How, what narrative, what story will you tell that will, that will lead them to, to decide? And so, um, um, you know, my, my friend Steve Wisner, professor at Yale, a more senior clinical teacher to me, says he threatens the, his opponents in cases that we're going to drag your client through the lowest courts in the land. <laughs> um, but it's not just courts I'm talking about here. We're talking about when you call your cell phone provider to complain about the bill, you're talking to someone who's a creature of rules like everyone in a bureaucracy. Everyone is a creature of rules. What are the rules? They're invisible to you. They're hidden from you most of the time. But, but you're, you're, you're trying to find out what discretion do you have to help me? What is it that I can tell you that will lead you to decide in my favor? And when I talk to my students about this, you begin to see the way that the decision making, in a, in, in a, whether it's at that level, whether it's a, the trial court level, Every, in, in, inside a federal bureaucracy, inside a state bureaucracy, it's always the same, which is that there's somebody who's got some power to, to help you and some power to not help you, and finding a path, if, and if they can't, then is there someone above them, and usually in most systems, there's someone above them who has broader discretion, more able, and you learn from your interaction with the first person 
the kinds of things that you might say to the second person. So um, I have a sort of a classic story from my clinic of a, of a case involving um, a legal indeterminacy where, where having to make decisions was difficult. We, we sued a, um, um, a car dealership that had charged our client twice the value of a used car. And I won't go through uh, all of the decisions we had to make about which jurisdiction to bring it in and what causes of action, what story to tell, what relief to seek. Those are all, those are all the kinds of decisions lawyers make on a, daily, on a daily basis. But all of them, again, involving predictions of who the fact finder will be and how the fact finder and law finder will, will decide the case. But we faced a motion to dismiss that was granted on the grounds of, of a mandatory arbitration clause. And it was, a, it was a crazy, unconscionable arbitration clause that said that the car dealership had the right to sue our client, but our client only had the right to arbitrate. And that if she did, they got to choose the arbitrator subject to a right of veto. They got to choose though the arbitrator. There were no other rules stated except that she had to pay half the cost of arbitration. So we thought the clause was unconscionable, um, but we still, the trial judge dismissed us and we, and we had to decide to arbitrate or to appeal. And, and so how do you begin to face the question of whether to arbitrate or not when the, you don't know who the arbitrator will be, you don't know what the rules of arbitration will be. Um, and so that kind of analysis of, of a choice is the kind of thing that lawyers face all the time. Uh, we decided that because the, uh, the car dealership was a repeat player in arbitration, that they must have um, arbitrators that they use. And even if we have the right to veto, they must have a group of arbitrators who themselves are repeat players. That is, they want repeat business. So would an arbitrator who wants to get more appointments from a car dealership um, decide that price alone would be grounds to hold a contract unconscionable. Well, we, we concluded that probably we wouldn't get a fair shake if we went to arbitration, so we appealed to the Court of Appeals, and a year and a half later we won and it sent back to the trial court. And so it seemed like we'd done the right thing, established a great precedent, but at that moment we we're about to do discovery and the car dealership went into bankruptcy and there the case remained. So, um, it could be that had we gone the other route, uh, we might have gotten some money out of the arbitration and the client would have been paid before they, they went into, into bankruptcy. So it's a kind of a situation where you, 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 you're trying to define what the, what the um, uh, factors are to be used in making your decision. And then in retrospect, you reflect on them to see if uh, the things that you thought were going to happen happen, and if not, what did you do? What did you do wrong? And it's one of the ways in which we try to teach our students to respond to the fact that the, the fact of indeterminacy. What did you learn from the situation? Um, so clinicians see the law from the bottom up. My colleague Ann Shalek writes about uh, clinical jurisprudence, where she says that the, that the, a site. an important site to see what law is is the law office. What the lawyers advise clients about risks and about actions to take. And if the clients go along with what they learn from their lawyers, that is the law. And, that, and so, again, moving away from seeing the appellate court as the place, you see it inside law offices. We see the way law works in the lives of our clients, the way, um, and, and that uh, is another way to see it. So, and even in, in transactional matters, two lawyers come together to negotiate something. And they both have competing claims of what, of what the law is. Uh, and ultimately, they enter into an agreement where either one of them is persuaded by the other that this is the controlling rule, or they make their own rule, uh, or they disagree as to their predictions of what a court would do when faced with a breach of the contract or whatever it is. And they both either go away believing that the contract satisfies their needs or not. But law there becomes, uh, again, uh, no one, there's no one to rule on it except in, in case of a breach. 
So that's what I mean by indeterminacy of law. Let me move to indeterminacy of facts. Um, the clinical education introduced to the curriculum the idea that, that uh, uh, facts are central for their own sake, and mostly in, in, in reading appellate cases, the facts become a way to, man to look at hypothetical changes in facts that might, that might shift the doctrinal uh, response. But um, students in the clinic expect that they're going to interview a client who will tell them the facts. Um, they quickly learn that for a multitude of reasons, reconstruction of a historical event is problematic. Um, memories are flawed. Uh, subjectivity introduces distortion. Facts are constructed to be consistent with preconceptions. Filling occurs. Biases and self-interest and a desire to please the lawyer produce wishful thinking. And so it's not unusual for the interview with the client to produce something other than what might be called the facts. Um, and th th that's all before saying that people, that some people, some people lie. Um, and so we face the, the question of, of, of facts from two perspectives. We lawyers are asked to do something difficult. We're asked to engage in systematic belief that is, let's believe everything the client says and proceed from there and see what that looks like. And we're also asked to engage in systematic doubt. Um, um, Michael Tiger, in a book called Nine Principles of Litigation in Life, says, um, we'll see that a client's story must never be taken without skepticism. If we've internalized the sacred obligation of a lawyer to give the very best counsel and advocacy of which he or she is capable, we'll see that skepticism must be governed by the desire to serve that obligation. He goes on to say, when skepticism turns to cynicism, it's time for a sabbatical. Um, but we do, need to, we do need to start with the client's story as the beginning point for searching for, um, uh, searching for what we think of as the fact. And my students sometimes imagine that the spy satellite has gone overhead and that there's a videotape which will give us an objective, truthful picture of what happened. And, and actually, strangely enough, uh, I, we took on four different administrative cases recently. And in two of them, there were videotapes. Uh, one of them, our client was, uh, um, was charged with falling asleep on the job. And sure enough, there's a video of him sleeping. And in another, our client was charged with spitting on a security guard at a homeless shelter for which he was uh, evicted. So those, there were, were videotapes. And, and, and yet the videotapes don't tell the whole story, as you can imagine. There's a, something happened before and something happened after. Some context exists that explains the situation. And our lawyer, a job of a lawyer sometimes is to look for excuses that explain away or explain the client's behavior in, in, with enough sufficiency, in, 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 with enough persuasiveness that the fact finder will decide uh, for you. And so the problem of finding, of, of finding facts is not just sorting relevant from irrelevant facts, but um, uh, finding factual evidence to support factual propositions that, if believed, will prove a cause of action or a defense. Um, and, um, and I was going to, I don't have time to do it. I have a student, our students write reflect, reflection memos each week. And uh, one of them wrote, I underestimated the amount of time and frustration an attorney spends on just trying to gather the information necessary to give legal advice. So far, every case I'm currently working on required me to investigate deeper and longer than I had assumed. Material information, which I naively assumed clients would know offhand, was was constantly missing or unavailable. There are three sets of templates that have to be overlapped in, in, in using, developing and using facts. Formal rules like discovery, uh, rules of evidence, constraints on investigation contained in model rules of professional conduct, rules about information that must be con concealed, rules about information that may not be concealed, um, um, et cetera. All the rules of procedure uh, affect how we think about facts. And that's one of the templates against which we look at facts. 
And the second templates involves a set of decisions about the nature of the information that we seek, the sources of that information, um, the likelihood that the resources that we could expend to get the information will produce the information, um, the, the translation of that information into evidence that's admissible, and, inference and, 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 and constructing the inferences that ought to arise from that piece of evidence, and um, um, the construction then of a story that, that is built around that evidence. Uh, that's the second template. And then the third template involves a set of predictions about how fact finders, your audience, will respond um, when uh, to a particular uh, story, or how will a witness respond when approached, how will a witness respond on the stand, um, and, how, and, and, and uh, what additional knowledge can you gather about those people, those places, uh, in, in order to make those predictions, you know, about uh, a trial lawyers who do jury studies and the, and the like. So there's no handy cookbook for any of this. Um, and um, clinicians teach subparts of it in classes on legal interviewing and on fact investigation and on case theory and on uh, information bargaining and negotiation and on storytelling. We're very influenced in my clinic these days by, by narrative theory. Um, What's the, uh, what's the trouble point in the story and how does the trouble get resolved by the application of a moral or in our world by a legal rule uh, that might pr re produce a happier steady state. So we try though in, with our students to have them engage in the contextualized search for, for information and then the application of it in terms of creating a case theory and telling a story. I want to talk, I realize that, I'm, uh, that we don't have so much time, so quickly talk, talk about the indeterminacy of the lawyer-client relationship. The lawyer-client relationship is bounded by some rules. Uh, confidentiality, zealous advocacy, loyalty, um, and um, we know about those from professional responsibility. We have um, law on fees, on retainers, uh, malpractice. Um, but the characteristics of the lawyer-client relationship are not studied in the classroom. Um, the lawyer-client relationship develops behind closed doors, difficult to study, um, but it develops in, in, in light of the expectations of both the lawyer and the client, their, their needs, values, and behaviors. And so they tend to be different in each, for each lawyer-client relationship. Um, and, um, you know, rules define what you must do, and rules define what you may not do, but rules don't decide what you ought to do, or what you might do, or what you shouldn't do for clients um, uh, that are in, 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 in uh, just because of some, at some sense you have about what's the right thing to do. Um, and because, le because the, the client's problems don't easily disaggregate between legal and non-legal. Um, the lawyer has to figure out which of the client's non-legal problems will the, will the lawyer address. Sometimes we're called on to be psychiatrists, social workers, bankers, financial planners, um, and the like. And, and those roles overlap with our ability to help the client solve legal problems. Uh, and sometimes we're beyond our, our comfort level in terms of tackling problems we know nothing about. So sorting that out uh, is part of what we mean by the indeterminacy of the lawyer-client relationship. Um, and uh, my students tend to want to have a client who, and I, when I was teaching the human rights clinic, um, they wanted them to be pure victims of human rights abuses, anxious to stay in the United States, eager to help their lawyers with straightforward stories, prompt attendance at meetings, um, appointments, and compliant attention to lawyer requests. It, uh, it would be nice as well if they limited their needs to those uh, uh, within the lawyer's competence, and they ought to express their gratitude in the end with a big uh, hug and a kiss. Um, but what they learn instead is that clients are often 
uh, complicit in their own oppression, um, sometimes tell a story that they think is a better story than the one that actually happened to them, and uh, they break the student's heart. So to the extent that students expect to locate their zeal for representing a client in their, within their belief in the justice of the client's cause, they're often disappointed. If they want to locate it in their affection for the client, as I said, their hearts are sometimes broken. And um, the, so we need to help students put their expectations uh, aside and to deal with the actual client who happens to be there. Uh, and um, drafting retainer agreements where clients contractually agree to be prompt uh, and comply with all lawyer requests and be truthful don't exactly produce the results that the students are looking for because the essentialized determinant client doesn't often come in the door. Um, and I say to my students sometimes, you know, if you don't want to represent uh, difficult people, you don't want to re represent people who are a little bit crazy, if you don't want to represent people who have done something bad, then maybe you're in the wrong profession because our work as lawyers is often to help those people uh, mitigate the, the harm they're doing to themselves uh, through the work that we, that we do. Um, so we want to escape our assumptions in order pr to provide service to the particular client who uh, is there. Um, uh, indeterminacy of problem solving. Um, the clients come to lawyers to get, of course, help in solving problems. And sometimes the problem's routine, or it seems so. The lawyer does for the client. Client is determinate, preparing the papers for a real estate uh, closing, or filling out an application for permanent residence, or the like, filling out a form. All sometimes deceptively seem simple. And, um, but most of the time, the clients come in with problems we've never solved before. And their problems are messy, they're complicated, they're confused. And, um, and often the client has predefined the solution to the problem in ways that, as the lawyer discovers, uh, are not necessarily the best way. Someone comes for bankruptcy and they've turns out they've spent twice what they should have on a used car, or they, they, they come in saying they want political asylum when some other remedy, immigration remedy, would be best. Uh, Etc. So lawyers have to sort out and define the problem. So first, the first step in, in, in problem solving is figuring out what problems you're going to solve. Um, and lawyers uh, want, want to work on problems where they will have a positive effect on, on the outcome. And, and so we present to clients possible choices for action that most closely approximate achieving their goals. Um, and um, it, it, Tony Amsterdam said, problem solving is indeterminate because the demands, constraints, and methods of analyzing and dealing with unstructured situation in which, in which the issues haven't been pre-identified, where the facts are unclear, unascertained, imperfectly ascertainable, still developing outside the lawyer's control, not subject to the lawyer's uh, sometimes the lawyer can control them and sometimes they can't. So problem solving looks to a process of, 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 of uh, structuring and, and devising paths to accomplish client goals. And uh, Dean Minow and Dean Rakoff from Harvard say that if we don't do a better job of teaching our students to do problem solving, if lawyers aren't the problem solvers that people with problems are going to turn elsewhere for problem solvers. And they claim that business schools are doing a better job than we are of teaching problem solving. And that's why they are pr proposing these courses on problem solving. Um, but we, you know, we, we, problem solvers need to be people who are good at identifying multiple paths. Problem solvers need to be creative thinkers. Problem solvers need to engage in uh, what Amsterdam calls ends means thinking. Goals, what are the goals, how do we get there? Um, the indeterminacy of skills. Um, back at the beginning, 
I'm I was old enough to be able to say back at the beginning of clinical education, or at least of clinical teachers coming together to think about what it is we were doing, we thought that the project was going to be to give critique. That is, that there would be performances, and we would critique the performances of our students. And that implied that we would have both a methodology of critique and a theory of the thing that the, that the person was doing, a model against which critique would, would occur, and that that would be the substance of clinical, of clinical pedagogy. And we got caricatured in those years as skills teachers, and, and, and that inhibited the, the growth of clinical education, I think. But a lot of clinical teachers went from there to become skills teachers and created great simulation courses in law schools, you know, trial practice, interviewing, counseling, negotiation, and the like. Um, but others of us um, uh, began to worry about the creation of an orthodoxy or a religion of skills. Um, we, um, you know, the one that I always think about is the Ten Commandments of Cross-Examination was a part of the er early part of the, uh, of the thinking about trial practice. And one of the commandments was don't ever ask a question you don't know the answer to. And yet, you know, how often do lawyers know the answer to every question? So thinking about that more conceptually and dividing questions into high safety, low safety, medium safety, whatever, getting as much information as you can, but realizing that you never actually know the answer. So we've, we've tried to move away from skills teaching that operates at a, at a prescriptive level. We don't want to create a new formalism. We want to, we want to teach skills and it's connected to values. Coming out of the McCrate report that talked about skills and values, we've moved to a merger of something we, that I like to call skills values. I get to make up a word. Um, uh, because no action that a lawyer takes is, doesn't implicate some value set. Um, so um, we aspire to think of the lawyering process as involving an interrelated set of theory-driven actions um, that need to be taught at a high enough level of abstraction as to be transferable from clinic to practice, from um, one practice setting to another, and perhaps most importantly, from familiar tasks to unfamiliar ones. So teaching at a higher level of abstraction enables that kind of transfer. And we, so we engage students in a reflective process which at the first level starts with planning. What, if there are practice guides you're going to look to to prepare to do this thing, there are many of them. If there are trial practice books, there are manuals, there are form books, whatever. Uh, how does your decision about what to do relate to those, to those materials? And then after the thing is done, let's look back and evaluate whether those were helpful ways for you to proceed. Did you learn from that and was the advice that you got from those written experts or other experts you consulted uh, the right way? So we're trying to teach a lifelong project of reflection in action and reflection on action it, that, that will enable people to learn over a lifetime. Um, finally, um, the indeterminacy of the student-teacher relationship. Clinics te teach in four different contexts. There is the design of the clinic and the selection of cases in the student's experience. That's number one. Uh, number two, we have a seminar where it's the controlled part of the clinic. It's the determinate part of the clinic. It's where there's a syllabus, where there are readings, where, there, where we move forward with uh, teaching uh, skills and values. There then there is supervision. The students come back and we work with them to prepare their cases and we work with them to reflect on their, on their work. Um, we, um, um, it's completely uh, related to what they're actually doing. They give us a, a memo in advance and we work from their agenda, from their learning, from their learning from experience. And then we do case rounds, which involves bringing groups of students together to engage in what, what we, you know, peer-assisted learning co-constructed knowledge where they share what they've learned with each other and they learn from each other and they bring the, the group's empirical knowledge to bear on planning and on reflection on, on experience. We think of this, I think of this as, 
as indeterminate just because so much of it can't be planned in advance. I don't know at the beginning of the semester which things are going to come up over the course of the semester except for the parts that I control through the seminar. Um, so we clinicians are the eyes and ears of the academy into the profession. We try to have critical distance from the profession but be part of the profession. We try to be part of the intellectual lives of our institutions in order to interact with our colleagues and learn from them and for them to learn from us about, about how best to, to uh, mediate among uh, um, the thing that worries all of us teachers, which is um, theory, the, the, the trichotomy of uh, um, theory and um, practice and doctrine in our, in our courses. Clinicians have become very influenced by, for example, critical theory and bringing critical theory into our seminars and at least on our faculty, the f uh, introduction of, of simulations and cross-disciplinary teaching has been influenced by the clinicians. Um, so I want to say, just to conclude, that what we do is we put students in positions of responsibility for the first times in their lives, the first time in professional role that they're responsible for other human beings. This is what I think of as the first moment of adulthood. And it's at that moment that, that a person is opened up to acquire the habits, the skills, and the values that will endure for their careers. It's going to happen somewhere. My view is it needs to happen in the law school and the person whispering in the ear of the student as they, as they make that transition from child to adult, from novice to lawyer, from student to professional, ought to be a law professor. And it's been my privilege over these 40 years to be the person that they see on their shoulders uh, when they, when, uh, as they go forward. Thank you very much. That's a really good question. Um, we, we, uh, Could you summarize the yeah, question? The question was, <laughs> sure, the, Alex asked whether, why isn't the teaching of social justice one of the indeterminacies? Looking back on it, I assume he means, what's the content of what it is we should teach? What is social justice and how is it that we teach it? Um, and, and I think that that, that, that um, I think it's a great question. Why, that is, that is at a certain level, uh, an indeterminacy, although I think we have our individual views on what that just world would look like. Um, we, we, uh, we know that we can't impose that view on our students, but we do want them to see the certain ways in which, in, in, in which the, the lawyers have the capacity to do harm and lawyers have the capacity to do good. And, you know, I had in, in one of the stories that I was going to ask about was in the, in the, uh, mortgage securitization crisis, the subprime crisis, where were the lawyers? Uh, what, 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 do we, what do we expect of lawyers? What kind of a justice talk do we think lawyers should have with clients who are, who are uh, about to or are doing, are doing bad? Um, I like to think, and there have been, there have been a good number, there's a, there's a good body of literature on counseling and justice counseling and truth counseling uh, that lawyers might uh, might do, and of course at the core of clinical education is the teaching of professional responsibility, uh, but I don't, I, I think your question deserves a, a, a more thoughtful response uh, in, 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 this is what I'm, what I'm uh, 
this pay, this talk comes from a chapter that'll be in the in the book about about um, uh, clinical theory, uh, pedi clini yeah, the, sorry, theory and practice of clinical clinical pedagogy, and I'm I'm thinking maybe you've you've struck a nice uh, nerve for me here. Thanks. Do you have a response? Well, I, I'm looking back. I wonder if it is dropped out of our teaching mission. So, I, I hope. Extent, and I wonder if, if in part that's because a lot of the early clinical work uh, tended to involve family, a place where there's, where social justice, I think, come, becomes particularly difficult to, to see and to, uh, and to become a part of the structured part of the process. I wonder if we don't do well, that. I, I guess I, I think I, on Friday I was at the New York Clinical Theory Workshop where my co-author Sue Bryant and, and Conrad Johnson presented a paper, one of our chapters, and uh, someone said, well, you, you know, you talk too much ab ab about, uh, Doug Frankel from Penn said, you talk too much about social justice. We have to teach clinic for everybody, not just the, not just the social justice types. Uh, and and Sue Bryant's answer was, we're, we're, they all, everybody has to be has to be it has to be concerned about the capacity of the of the judicial system, the capacity of the legal system, the capacity of society to deliver to deliver uh, uh, justice. We want we want the students to resist socialization into the into uh, the shoddy practices that are sometimes uh, uh, the the way of life in 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 different aspects of the system. We want to be able to resist that kind of socialization. So I think we're still, we don't, but we no longer, I think, live in the world where we thought we were training legal services lawyers in clinics. There aren't jobs. There aren't, there aren't, you know, not all of our students could get jobs as public interest lawyers or lawyers for the poor. And so uh, it was useful for us to realize that and to kind of grow up and see that we were educating lawyers, not just public interest lawyers, but we still, they all have some responsibility for, for, for justice. Yeah. I wanted to ask about outcomes. So we've been doing this for a little while, and I imagine you have some sense of the snapshot of the legal profession before clinical education became such an important part of the law school pedagogy. Um, and, and you have a snapshot of what that legal profession looks like now, and the effects of the clinical endeavor on the, at least the early years of practice out there in the early years you know, of, of practice. If, if, your, if the person on your shoulder has been a law professor as opposed to a, a senior attorney, um, and I'm curious about your reflections about that. Well, um, I wish that there had been a way, or I wish that we had collected in, empirical evidence because what we've got are anecdotes. Um, we, uh, we know that um, certain things have changed and um, we didn't anticipate the growth of the gigantic law firm as a, as a model where lawyers would lose control of the institutions within which law was practiced or that or that as much would be driven by uh, billing as is the case. And I think one of the failures of clinical education was, and I don't have an answer to how we do it, is to build into our um, teaching something about the economics of practice. We expect students to work as many hours as it takes and more than, than, than like on, on cases. So we, don't, we really aren't concerned about the economics of, of practice. On the other hand, I think that the, uh, um, the capacity of lawyers who go into uh, work situations where they need to be ready to, to, to practice, uh, that's hugely improved for having been in a clinic. And my students who have been in big law firms tell me that they feel like they have um, uh, the ability to do much more than the firm assigns them to do as at the beginning of their practice. They feel infantilized by the work that they're, that they're given. So I think at some level we're ahead of 
of where the firms have seen the first year, their early lawyers. But I don't, I, 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 I wish I could say we've transformed the legal profession. Uh, and, um, I, you know, I like to think that we've transformed some aspects of it, but, but uh, I, I don't have a good way to do outcome measures, except when I go to the alumni reception, I say, boy, I remember when you sent me into the prison. That just changed the way in which I thought about legal institutions. So I'd like to have a snappier answer to you. With Yes, 23% of all the students who, <laughs> more and more employers who come to our law school only want to interview students who have been in the clinic. That's a good thing. And the New York Court of Appeals just, just uh, decided that clinical education would be the, a very important site for getting the kind of, of uh, pro bono experience uh, that uh, they were going to require for admission to the bar. So we get some votes of confidence. <laughs>